Is the United Nations part of the problem or part of the solution? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program. I'm Muayn Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Professor Ardim Sais. Ardim Sais is Assistant Professor of Law at Queen's University. Among his numerous additional functions, between 2019 and 2021, he served as a member of the Group of Eminent Experts on Yemen, the UN Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry investigating violations of international law in that country. His numerous publications include, most recently, The United Nations and the Question of Palestine, Rule by Law and the Structure of International Legal Subalternity. And I'm informed that I received a copy before the author did. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, uh, RD. Um, so I'm pleased to let you know it actually uh, is out in the real world. It's just been published um, last week, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Ardim says it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. And I'd like to start um, by asking, your, your book is very much focused on the United Nations and public international law as they relate to the question of Palestine. I'm not going to ask you um, to, uh, to recount, obviously, the whole history, but um, for the uninitiated, what are the most important aspects of UN involvement in the question of Palestine and of public international law in relation to Palestine um, that you feel we need to take away with us after reading your important new book? First of all, thank you very much for having me on this uh, on this show, Maureen. As I've told you before, I. I'm a big fan of what you do with this show, and uh, you do a service to the public with it. So I'm thank you, and it works um, because of people like you. So thank you for accepting <laughs> the invitation. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I came to this project uh, after many years of working with the United Nations uh, in in occupied Palestine. I served with UNRWA between 2002 and the 2000. UN Refugee Agency. That's right, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, as it is called. Uh, I served with uh, with UNRWA from 2002 to 2014, uh, four years in the Gaza Strip in Gaza City at the headquarters there, and then seven years as the head of the agency's legal office in Jerusalem, and then uh, duty service in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and so on. And I went on to work for UNHCR and, and had a career with the United, the United Nations. Nations High Commissioner for, uh, for Refugees. Yes, refugees. yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I came to the United Nations with a real belief that international law as a normative force matters in the world. Uh, many of us, um, certainly those of us who study in the university international law, who studied on the basic principles of the liberal order, um, believe that at bottom law matters if order is to be, is to be uh, um, had on the international plane and indeed on the domestic plane. Um, but I must say that and I think this won't come as any surprise to many of your listeners, uh, all the time that I'd spent in Palestine, and there wasn't a week that went by that I wasn't challenged in my faith on the usefulness of international law as a means of having redress for injustice. And so... Um, if I can interrupt you, was, was this because of problems that you um, uh, discovered in the law itself, or problems in the application of the law, or both, perhaps? In, in initially, initially, uh, it was pro certainly problems in the application of the law. And so as somebody who is cognizant of the importance of this order, somebody who believes, still believes in it, I increasingly became, became um, skeptical as to whether that was the only problem with the law, that is, its lack of enforcement. Maybe there was something else about the law itself that had it embedded within it some uh, some inequities and so on. So I began to, to engage more critically with international law, both as a practitioner, but also as a scholar. I used to teach as an adjunct at Beers 8 and other places when I was in Palestine and so on. And so I left, uh, I guess it would be in 2014, I left, I left UNRWA uh, and went on to do a PhD. Uh, I went off to Cambridge and decided I was going to write a book on the UN and the question of Palestine. And one might ask, why ever would you do that? Certainly, there's so much written 
um, on Palestine and international law or on the UN. And that is, that is true. In fact, I uh, participated in that and had published very, uh, um, uh, um, very engaged, if you like, as, as, as an academic practitioner. I was the editor in chief of the Palestine Yearbook of International Law for over a decade and so on. But one thing I found when I started scratching away at the surface is that notwithstanding the fact that the question of Palestine is the longest running geopolitical problem uh, on the agenda of the United Nations, there has yet to be written a standard single scholarly volume, if you like, not a standard one, but a scholarly volume that is critical in looking at how the UN has managed or indeed mismanaged the question of Palestine through international law and so on. So that was the entry point for me. Uh, I decided to do the PhD. I did it, and then I turned it into a book, which is what we have here. So it's a long project. Mm -hmm. Now, the essence of the project, which has now just been published, I guess, on the 29th of November, um, International, International Day. Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian People. That's right, the 75th iteration of it, if I might. Um, so uh, of, of the year since 1948, but by the way, um, the essence of the book is this. Um, the UN holds itself out as, as the standard bearer of the international rule of law, which means that anything that it does, or indeed anything that it doesn't do, needs to be consistent with international law. It is and an I, the custodian of the international legal order. That is precisely it. It is, in a sense, the custodian of the international legal order. So I asked a simple question. Well, what happens when the custodian of the international legal order engages in acts or omissions that run counter to what international law requires of it. And so I've traced this vacillating, what I call a vacillating gulf between what international law requires and UN action over time in its management of the question of Palestine. And I was able to identify through my research certain common themes that some of the common themes are that as opposed to the international rule of law, which operates on this principle that all subjects of the legal system, states, uh, individuals, non-self-governing groups, and so on, various subjects of that system, are held to account under international law, regardless of their position in the international order. Some are more equal than others, states have more authority, and so on. But all this to say that the rule of law requires universal application of norms as applicable to each of these subjects. And that's what the UN holds itself out as. And then I've, I found the more I scratched away at all the key moments that I examined, which I'll get into, I found that the UN was operating in accordance with what I call an international rule by law, mm -hmm. where law is used, abused, um, <clears throat> applied uh, in a disproportionate or rather uh, a double standard way, if you like, uh, an inequitable way, um, not aimed at uh, trying to give effect to justice, but rather aimed at providing hegemonic powers that use the United Nations or operate within the United Nations to give effect to more power, to give effect to their foreign policy goals, to give effect to uh, an order that they wish to impose on the global subaltern class. And, and so I just, sorry, go ahead. Here I just um, like to interrupt your train of thought, if I may. Um, because the UN is, of course, a multi-headed hydra. Um, when you speak about the UN, are you talking about the institution and its leadership and its staff and its agencies? Or are you talking about bodies such as the Security Council and the General Assembly, which operate under the UN, but whose decisions are taken by governments that are members of those bodies rather than the UN itself? Or is it the way that one group of institutions is implementing policy through the other? Great question. In fact, that is an extremely important uh, foundation of the book. Whereas some view the UN as the sum of its parts, that is being states that are each of their discrete parts that come together for the organization, or others tend to look at the UN as an independent institution. It's neither one nor the other. It's in fact um, both at one and the same time. And so I chart keeping that in view, I chart actions of the United Nations, whether it's the political organs, that is the General Assembly or the Security Council, or the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the ICJ, International Court of Justice, or other organs like the Trusteeship Council or uh, uh, the Economic and Social Council and so on, 
um, keeping that in view. And then I also look at the secretariat, which is the administrative sort of arm of the organization that is headed up by the secretary general. So yes, states use the organization to give effect to their foreign policy and ideally work collectively uh, to give effect to certain goals but through the political organs. But at the same time, the, the organization is also independent under international law and through its secretary general and its staff. I used to be one. And so I'm well aware of the UN administrative law that requires, for instance, staff of the organization, starting with the secretary general, to maintain their independence, to not take instruction or attempt to receive instruction from any member state and so on. And so you have within the UN both of these structures. And so that's a key factor in the book. But going back to what I was, uh, uh, where we left off, I think was with the rule by law. By where, law yes. Yeah. So I, I found that through UN actions, whether taken by the Secretariat as independent organization or its principal judicial organ, the ICJ, or indeed by the political organs, you have a repeated, if you like, thread. Uh, series of actions at key moments in the UN's engagement with Palestine that produce a singular result. And that is where law is used, abused, as I say, um, applied in, in a way that isn't very equal, et cetera, to give rise to what I call Palestinian legal subalternity. Um, and the essence of this legal subalternity, and this is, a, I think, the novel aspect of the book, is that through the use of international law, the abuse of law through the rule by law, I argue that there is a condition in international law, a condition that is a fixed feature of the international legal order that I call international legal subalternity. The, the essential feature of which is that international law is held out by the United Nations to a global underclass, a subaltern underclass, as offering a promise of justice but each time that underclass attempts to avail themselves of, of the value uh, and uh, a justice that is ostensibly held out to them through international law, the organization itself shifts the goalposts, making it impossible to realize the, the justice that is promised thereby. And um, I think Palestine embodies this condition, this legal subaltern condition, more than any, better than any other um, uh, actor on the international plane. And you see this take place at various paradigmatic moments in the history of the organization, which is another usefulness of, of Palestine, looking at Palestine as the key case well, study of this. I think many people listening to you will recognize um, uh, the general points you're making, um, but if we go back to your book, are there, are there key points of inflection, if you will, um, that substantiate um, uh, your perspective on legal subalternity. Indeed. Um, I guess the first place to begin with in terms of moments in history, sites where this ILS condition sort of shows itself, is actually, it actually predates the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And that would be the interwar period in the League of Nations period. There are five moments, and this is chapter two of the book, five moments that bear recalling, which many of your uh, uh, watchers and, and viewers will be aware of. Uh, th those moments are I guess in chronological order, the Hussein McMahon correspondence, followed by of 1915-16, followed by the Sykes-Picot Agreement, whereby the French and the British carved up into spheres of influence the um, Middle East, if you like. That was done through secret treaty making. Uh, and then the uh, France, Britain, and Russia. Initially. That's right. And then, um, then you have the uh, Balfour Declaration of 1917, a bilateral undertaking, if you like, between His Majesty's government to the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine, then inhabited by a vast majority of local indigenous Palestinian Arabs. And then you have the League of Nations uh, covenant of the League of Nations, Article 22 of which uh, affirmed the provisional independence of the people of Palestine. And then importantly, the, the League of Nations mandate uh, given by Britain, the Balfour Declaration. Indeed, that incorporated the Balfour Declaration. And the sum of all of these moments is that the legal subalternity or the contingency, the weakness, the lack of legal subjectivity of the Palestinian natives of Palestine at the time is stripped away from them through the League of Nations system, through British secret treaty making, 
through operation of international law. Now, these moments are typically looked at by you know, um, political scientists and historians through those lenses. But I tend to I tend to take this opportunity to provide a legal history of what those moments actually meant in legal terms for and, the Palestinians. And your argument is that the UN's engagement with Palestine was constrained from the very outset because the stage had been set, so to speak, by these um, documents and commitments that it inherited from the period before it was established. Well, one would think, right, right, that one would think. But, but in, in fact, the stage, as you said, quite rightly, was set by the international legal system of the day during the interwar period. Uh, but the unique thing here is that the United Nations created in, in the aftermath of World War II and the t complete tumult that that, 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 that was for, for global society, um, basically held itself out as, as, as offering a change in the way things were, right? So you're looking at a period of late empire. Which is why the League of Nations was replaced by precisely. the United Nations. That, that's precisely it. So if you look at the, the core treaty of the United Nations, the constituent document, the UN Charter, you see all these references that were not there in the League of Nations covenant, references to human rights, references to self-determination, references to ideas of we, the people, sort of eliciting this idea of democracy and the importance of majority rule and so on. So all this to say, at a time in 1947, merely two years after the beginning of, of the UN system, um, at a time when one would have thought that the international rule of law as represented through the UN system and its charter would have prevailed uh, in Palestine, uh, you find the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And the General Assembly, uh, as well as the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, UNSCOP, is given the hand handed over by the, the British, the issue of Palestine. And they study what they call the future government of Palestine, um, which over time, if you read the documents, changes from future government of Palestine to the question of Palestine, which is ostensibly much broader. And this was done through sleight of hand, in fact, by the great powers while they were negotiating the terms of reference of UNSCOP. But what I do in chapter three of the book is I look at resolution 181 of the General Assembly, 29 November, 1947, which purported to partition Palestine. I look at its terms as many other scholars have. I assess those terms on, under international law. And then I look at what gave rise to those terms. And I, that's when I look deeply into the record. So what are the terms? Well, 56% of the country was purportedly given over or under a resolution of the General Assembly, 181 to the one third minority population, Jewish po population, which had been largely made up of settlers from Europe over the last or the preceding 30 or 40 years. Um, the two thirds majority population, native Arab indigenous, um, were given one third of their country under this purported uh, 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 partition. But then when you scratch away even deeper, it gets worse. Um, the population of the so-called Jewish state that was meant to be established was roughly one to one. 50, 50, par. Yeah. yeah, it was roughly 50 50. And in fact, looking at the records, you can see, in, in fact, the Arab population was about, about one or 2,000 more than the Jewish population in the so called Jewish state, which gives rise to questions well, however, would it be possible for this Jewish state, which under the terms of Resolution 181 was required to institute democratic principles of government, how would they ever be able to do that when, in fact, they were outnumbered by the Arabs in their in the state from from the off? The question is, how could it be a Jewish state, really? Precisely. And, and then the real question, working backwards, is knowing these facts, knowing, having this empirical information in front of them, however could it be possible that UNSCOP, the United Nations Special Committee for Palestine, would actually believe this to be the right way to go and recommend partition by majority vote? Um, to the General Assembly. Recommend it, they did, nonetheless. And I found a number of points in there that were really questionable. They knew full well, for instance, that the British weren't going to support partition, that the British would leave uh, the country, including their police powers and so on. And notwithstanding that, um, they, they went ahead with the partition, knowing, again, that there would be no one to impose law and order, that the Zionist groups had made it clear to UNSCOP in the UN record that if they did get, that is the Zionist organization, the Jewish agency, did achieve a decision of the General Assembly that purported to partition the country in two, and if the Arab majority of the country said, rejected it, which in, in fact they did, 
that they would impose it, the Jewish uh, forces would impose it on the Arabs. This is almost verbatim from the record uh, in... in um, so, uh, Chronicle meeting. of a Tragedy Foretold. Oh, well, there you are. They, they knew what to expect and went ahead and recommended it anyway. That, that's precisely it. So, um, so that's chapter uh, three. And, and I think that's probably the most important empirical chapter because what it does is it shows that there was a violation of the law on self-determination of peoples as it applied, the principle applied to class A mandates. In this case, Palestine was a class A mandated on, under the League of Nations covenant whose provisional independence was recognized under that covenant. Um, that it was violated by the General Assembly at a time that the Assembly and the, and the UN was holding itself out as having this great fidelity to the new world order, the rule of law. It was basically more rule by law, but just under a different guise. And it's the most important chapter because it sets in stone, uh, which remains to this day, the idea that the only way to resolve the question of Palestine is through a partition uh, of the territory between Jewish uh, to, uh, between a Jewish state and an Arab state, and, and of course and none of this was done. Forgive me, Moin, but none of this was done at all with the say so um, or consent of the majority Palestinian population. It was all done quite expressly and as a matter of record. Unscop is very clear in in their in the documents and the UN record, very very clear that this had nothing to do with self determination. In fact, they said if self determination was to be given effect, UNSCOP acknowledged, it would be impossible to give effect to the Jewish national home policy. And therefore, Palestine is, in their words, sui generis, somehow apart or different. And they acknowledged this right from the off in 1947. It really is astounding. And to my mind, embodies this idea of rule by law through the UN. And against this, um you propose a very different concept or you discuss um, a very different concept, which is third world approaches to international law, TWIL. Um, can you tell us a little about that and why it's relevant to this discussion we're having? Uh, sure, uh, I will uh, like to get into TWIL, but before I do, I realized I was a bit verbose earlier, but I would like to just trace some of those other moments for, yeah, for the listeners. Yeah, um, so the next moment is the establishment by the United Nations immediately following 1948 and the Nakba, the establishment of a distinctive institutional and normative regime focused for Palestinian refugees. That is uh, the regime that was established by the General Assembly, the same General Assembly that purported to partition Palestine, quite literally months after the partition resolution. Created UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, as well as the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine. So two separate bodies, subsidiary organs of the General Assembly mandated to help Palestinian refugees and indeed to seek a durable solution for Palestinian refugees for UNCCP. So separate and a apart, political and a humanitarian institution. In that's America. exactly it. So UNRWA was the humanitarian side, no durable solutions mandate for the refugees. UNSCOP, a political body meant to serve as a good offices between the Arab states that had fought the war with the newly established state of Israel. Note, for instance, no Palestinian leader or leadership was before UNSCOP. They weren't invited to the table and so on. And so these bodies sort of, the, the, the UNCCP over time fizzled out. They ended their work in 1963, even though they actually still continue to exist formally. Um, but they were unable to realize a durable solution for the Palestinian refugees. In the meantime, UNRWA just kept doing its work on a temporary basis, even though it, its mandate has been renewed for decades um, with no durable solution in sight. And in the meantime, you have UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, serving every other refugee on earth with a different regulatory framework. So that's that's the refugee problem. And then another big, big issue, another site where the rule by law emerges is with the UN's management of the occupied Palestinian territory post-1967. UN Along, management. Yeah, the UN management of it, if you like. So um, as many of you know, Israel has been an occupation of the OPT, occupied Palestinian territory, since 1967. That means for 56 years. But occupation is meant to be a temporary condition, um, during which time the occupying power cannot, as a matter of international law, be sovereign in the territory. 
And so the UN has done a wonderful job, I should say, largely following the decolonization period. Uh, in this 56 year period, it has gone to great lengths to document discrete violations by the occupying power of international humanitarian law or international human rights law, say the illegality of the settlements or torture against Palestinian detainees or what have you. Um, and yet it has failed, largely failed to determine the legality of the of the occupation as a regime as such. That is a because question Because that... just to be clear, military occupation, I mean, it sounds horrible and it is, but in and of itself is not illegal. That's right. That's absolutely right, Wayne. So because military occupation, because international law contemplates that parties will go to war with one another, states will do that, there must be rules of war that um, govern a situation where one state is in control of the territory of another. This is the law of belligerent occupation, and so it is agnostic on legality. Legality does come in when dealing with issues outside of what we call international humanitarian law, which is what I've just described. Which are individual um, policies or activities of the occupying power. That's right. That's the IHL. Uh, legality does come into play when one considers the law governing use of force, initial use of force. Is it lawful or unlawful? So, for instance, to bring it down to the current, Russia illegally used force against Ukraine in February 2022, um, and indeed before then, in Crimea, I should, should add. And insofar as they ended up occupying portions of Ukraine, the occupation of those portions of Ukraine by Russia is unlawful. And yet there's still law that applies in this unlawful circumstance, IHL, the laws of belligerent occupation, which require Russia to do certain things or not to do certain things vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian civilian population subject to their control. So this regime, when looked at in, in the occupied Palestinian territory, has produced this very odd circumstance where the UN has documented chapter and verse, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documents on Israel's failure to abide by its obligations as an occupant. But it has yet to determine definitively the legality of Israel's very position, very presence in the occupied territory that itself gives rise to these violations. Right. So thankfully, there is who, 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 which is the body mandated to make that determination? Is it only the International Court of Justice? There is no single body mandated to do that. Um, in fact, as you'll, as your listeners or uh, viewers will find, uh, where I deal with this in the book, the General Assembly, as one of the two political organs of of the organization, has indeed qualified the occupation of the OPT as unlawful. They did this for four years running between 1977 and 1981. Uh, thereafter, for about 10 years, they failed to call it an illegal occupation or unlawful occupation. They said that the occupation was a violation of the UN Charter, which implies illegality because of Article 2, Subsection 4 of the Charter. But all this to say, only the General Assembly and ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council, for a period in the 1990s have qualified the occupation as unlawful. In the 1970s? It, actually, the GA in the 1970s, yes. late 70s Echo and 80s, ECOSOC in the 90s. Um, but the other organs, including the Secretary General um, and so on, the Security Council, have been silent. Well, the SG wasn't. Uh, Kofi Annan called it an illegal occupation in, 19, in 2001, I think it was, and then he walked it back literally four okay. days later. And, but and all this to say... Just a clarification... Um, if the Secretary General of the United Nations makes a statement that something is illegal, in this case, uh, um, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, does that have more than declarative value? Not particularly. Um, it, if, if it was a one-off and was not backed up by state practice as evinced, for instance, through resolutions being passed on an annual basis, mm -hmm. um, or customary international law, the answer would be no to the question. And so that's where, as you rightly pointed out, the ICJ comes into it as the principal judicial organ of the UN. So in my book, I recommend that the UN, if it's to give effect to the rule of law properly, um, the UN should seek an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the lawfulness of Israel's occupation, which, which, is, thankfully, now the which is now precisely the case. So uh, on the 30th of December, this is put together, this is discussed by me in a, in a prologue to the book, 
Um, while the book was actually going into print, these events were un uh, being uh, were unfolding before us, really a testament to just how easy it is for events to overtake scholars when they look at this question. How difficult it is to get the book on time. Oh, uh, that, That's right. But on 30 December 2022, the General Assembly passed resolution 77 forward slash 247. And anyone who wants to look at the question in that General Assembly resolution that has now been put before the ICJ can, it's in paragraph 18 of the resolution, a series of five questions or so, the nub of which is what the legal status of the occupation is after 56 years. And if the court indicates- Sorry, one of which or none of which? One of which. One of which. One yeah. of which. So there are five questions, but yes. the last question, the nub of, of, of the these questions is the most important one. Um, given Israel's continued settlement, uh, annexation, uh, violation of the Palestinian people's right to self-determination and so on, in the territory, what do these things mean for the legal status of the territory? Now, the question is before the court. Uh, the hearings will begin on the 19th of February in The Hague. We anticipate that the, the matter will be adjudicated by the court with a ruling sometime next, act, next uh, calendar year, 2024. And the idea is that <clears throat> if the court de declares the occupation to be unlawful, then that will fundamentally alter the political contours within the UN. How? Well, it will no longer mean that third states can require Palestine to negotiate the end of the occupation, because if the occupation is in and of itself an internationally wrongful act, the law of state responsibility, which is a subset of international law that governs responsibility of states for what we call internationally wrongful acts, the law of state responsibility would simply require Israel to end its occupation forthwith and unconditionally, give appropriate assurances of non-repetition, and pay appropriate forms of of compensation and 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 so on. In other words, um, if I steal your car, you're not under an obligation to negotiate with me about whether and how that, you get it back. That that is precisely the analogy that I use, not the car, but just a common theft in the book. You're absolutely right. I, as the thief, would not be in a position to require return of the item that I've stolen. Uh, to be effectuated through negotiation. And in this case, that's precisely what the UN has done across the board with respect to Palestine, this negotiations condition. It is adhered to by every principal organ of the United Nations, from the Secretariat, the Security Council on down, including by the ICJ and its advisory opinion on the wall. I would direct your uh, listeners to the, sec the penultimate paragraph of, of the majority opinion there. This is from 2004. From 2004, where they basically... I mark advisory opinion. Yeah. And, where... and then if I, um, it's called an advisory opinion, but that's a technicality. An advisory opinion is, is not an opinion that you're free to disregard. That's quite right. So uh, the, the ICJ exercises two types of jurisdiction. One, contentious jurisdiction, where one or more states have a dispute and they agree to settle that dispute by recourse to the ICJ and to agree to uh, be held to what the ICJ rules in that matter. And it only binds those states. And then a second jurisdiction, the advisory jurisdiction, which we're talking about now, where a legal question is placed before the court and the court is asked to answer it. And when the court does- It's binding. It, well, yeah, it, well, I won't say it's binding. Mm -hmm. Under international law, it is merely advisory. But to the extent that the court is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, and to the extent that it is the highest judicial body aimed at giving effect to international law and applying the rules of international law, then what it says is at the very least highly persuasive on the international plane among states. And what's more, to the extent that its rulings are based in established customary international law, those portions of the rulings are indeed binding. And so you find that the advisory jurisdictions typically exercised by the court in a very conservative way, and they do focus on custom and they do focus on treaty, things that are already binding in any case. So, I, yeah. Before turning to um, third world approaches to international mm -hmm. law, I, I just want to seek a small clarification on the issue we've just been discussing. You've mm -hmm. laid out very clearly the consequences of an ICJ advisory opinion um, that is really rule in these territories is no longer a military occupation and therefore illegitimate. What if the court decides we looked nothing particularly um, um, out of, uh, you know, there's nothing 
of particular concern here in the sense that we feel it's still legitimate to characterize the Israeli rule in these territories as a military occupation. What would that mean? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Just let me let me just clarify one thing. Please, we don't we don't anticipate the court would would say that because the issue is not whether or not it's a military occupation. Uh, it will be a military occupation, and the court won't. We don't anticipate the court saying that it isn't a military occupation just because Couldn't it the isn't. The court say actually um, this is an annexation and not an occupation. That, that's right. The court the court won't necessarily say it's an annexation and not an occupation. The court will say it's an occupation that purports to annex the territory. The annexation is unlawful and therefore it remains a military occupation, only an illegal one by virtue of I its see. attempt to annex. So it's a, it's a small nuance. Yeah. But the, but the, the, the larger point of the question, I think, is extremely valuable, Mine for which thanks. Let's say the court simply says, look, you've asked us what the impact of settlement and violation of self-determination and so on of this territory is on the legal status of the, of the occupation. And we affirm simply that the, ter that the occupation is merely that, an occupation and nothing more. Let's say it's silent on the legal status question. Well, this would, in my respectful view, be yet another indication of the international rule by law. Mm -hmm. um, that would leave the Palestinians in a lurch. That would leave the international community in a lurch. That is to say, how can it be that the organized international community through the UN has affirmed that the Palestinian people are a juridical people mm -hmm. with a right to self-determination, that their self-determination unit is the occupied Palestinian territory, that the occupying power Israel is not sovereign in that territory by virtue of being an occupied in occupation of it. Uh, how could it be that in view of the fact that occupation is meant to be temporary, the principal judicial organ can't find that Israel's actions taken in that territory to do three things. One, annex portions of the territory or all of it, violate the right, right of Palestinian people to self-determination in the territory, and third, impose a regime of alien subjugation and domination rooted in racial discrimination or apartheid. Through these three violations are what we call use Kogan's norms of international law, peremptory norms, derogation from which is not permitted under international law under any circumstance. How could it be that the UN principal judicial organ would declare in view of its own record, the UN's own record that demonstrates the violation of these three peremptory norms, that the regime that it would de determine that the regime violating these norms is itself not unlawful that would be absurd and it would to my in my respectful view give rise to yet further evidence of the very point i've been trying to to document um, and trace in the book now the hopeful international lawyer in me believes that the case is so strong before the icj that it is impossible for the court not to rule that Israel's continued presence in it, in the OPT, is unlawful. But that's the hopeful lawyer in me, and no no lawyer would ever give 100% uh, certainty on what the case would, would, would look like, uh, any case would look like. But uh, were I a betting man, I would bet that the court will do the right thing and declare Israel's occupation to be unlawful. And, um, and one, one last follow-up is, is the fact that it was only last year that the ICJ um, began considering this and did so only because there was a um, uh, decision from the a re request from the General Assembly instigated by the Palestinians. Does does this half century time lag, so to speak, um, validate the central thesis of your book? It does indeed. It does indeed, mm -hmm. um, and I think it has to do with the fact that the political discourse in the organization certainly since 1988 uh, and, and the move of the Palestine Liberation Organization to recognize Israel at Algiers in August of that, of that year, I do believe, that the discussion has been one of negotiating, negotiations you know, um, over a final status. And of course, we know where that, where that left the Palestinians and indeed where that has left the international community. There's a bad faith occupying power mm -hmm. running roughshod over the territory and colonizing it as we witness it now. Uh, before our eyes on Gaza, which I'm sure we will get to. Uh, and yet the international communities continues to, to wax lyrical about the need for a negotiated resolution. How do you negotiate the end of a theft? 
you know, the theft must be rectified by return of the, of the stolen goods, as you say. And then the last chapter deals with Palestine's attempt to gain membership in the organization, the UN, in 2011, and the, and the very odd, uh, though not surprising, uh, based on the thrust of the book, uh, interpretation given by the Security Council to Article 4.1 of the UN Charter, which governs membership of an entity as a state in the organization. This law, effectively, the law on membership of the organization has been historically given a very liberal, flexible uh, interpretation. All that is required is that a, there must be a state who seeks uh, membership in the organization must be uh, peace-loving, must be willing, uh, must accept their obligations under the UN Charter and willing and able to give effect to them. And of course, they must be a state. And Palestine is indeed a state at international law, but was unable to get through the Security Council on the question in 2011 by virtue of a UN, rather a US, US. Yeah. threat of a veto exercised, of course, under the power of the UN Charter given to veto powers, right? So it's this law that gives effect to this to this rule by law. And so I use that as, as the final example in the book. And over time, you have the common theme of legal subalternity of this subaltern group, Palestinians, running through um, from 1947 to the present, and interestingly so, across different historical paradigms, mm -hmm. the late empire where the Europeans were on in the ascendancy and on the top, uh, to the decolonial period in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where third world states were now the majority in the General Assembly. And one would think that that would fundamentally alter the approach. Well, it did to a certain extent. Palestine was given, was recognized in some way. It was given some international legal subjectivity by being you know, raised up as an observer state, for instance, in the organization. But it still remains on the outside looking in, in a legal sense, it's disenfranchised because it isn't a full member of the UN and kept that way by action of a member state under the UN Charter. That is although, under although I I guess and I, I don't know how relevant this really is to to the whole question of international law, but certainly at the UN during this era of decolonization, we saw that what had been primarily dealt with as an Arab-Israeli conflict increasingly became once again um, uh, the question of Palestine. And, and in this sense, um, you do then also devote considerable space and attention to um, what you term uh, twill, third world approaches to international law. Um, I still want to discuss the relevance of, of all these issues to the current crisis, but could you explain um, how, how that fits into the story? Sure. Well, I can't. Um, I can't uh, claim that twill is an idea is mine. Not at all. In fact, the the third world approaches to international law is a school of thought. It's an ec eclectic group of scholars that tends to write critically about international law and international legal order and international organizations, including the UN, from below. That is, from the vantage point of the global south, from the vantage point of the formerly colonized. And so there's a great many scholars who, who hail from the Indian subcontinent, from Africa, from Latin America, and so on, even Ireland, and so on. And so there's a network of scholars whose scholarship I use um, and is infused throughout the book, but I attempt to build on um, by offering this idea that Palestine's experience at the United Nations embodies this idea of international legal subalternity. And the importance there is and I identify this in the book as being one of Twail's blind spots in their own scholarship, is that for all of the Twail scholars' critique of international law and how it has operated over the course of the last 20 years or so, that's the, the scholarship has emerged over 20 years, 25 years, they failed, in my view, to identify, to name, call out, identify the common condition that they're deriding the common condition that is shared by the global underclass, whether non-self-governing peoples, refugees, uh, third world states to a certain extent, vis-a-vis -vis hegemonic Western states, no. not, uh, and so on. And so I, look, I, I could see in Palestine's experience this condition, and then I set out some of the core elements of the condition of international legal subalternity. There are three that I think are common they cross 
a cut, they cut across uh, the condition and indeed the uh, circumstances of other subaltern groups, which I don't deal to any great extent within the book, only in the introduction I do. And they're threefold. Uh, the first is the Eurocentricity of international law. There's no doubt about that. That will be cognizable to any Twail scholar, any uh, post-colonial scholar of the international order. Um, the second element of it is that third world sovereignty, ostensibly um, given rise to through decolonization in the 60s and the 70s and so on, is not a perfect sovereignty. In fact, it's a contingent sovereignty. Um, uh, you can easily, by way of example, <clears throat> traverse the borders and, and violate the territorial integrity and political independence um, of most any third world state if you're strong enough and powerful enough to do. And indeed, multilateral organizations do this all the time. The IMF is one, you know, just by way of example, the Bretton Woods institutions and so on. And then a third element is the neo-imperial power, which continues to reign uh, supreme uh, by in our now multipolar world, but up until a few years ago, unipolar world, mm -hmm. where the United States lords it over. The sun doesn't set, quite frankly, on the American empire. And Pax Americana is everywhere. And so the whole idea is that legal subalternity is a condition which the Twail scholars have yet to identify. And that's what I like to think is my, if you like, contribution to the scholarship. And indeed, what Palestine's contribution is to international law. And... And if we look at the present moment, um, uh, you look very closely at the United Nations, you look very closely at public international law, and you identify and discuss the ways in which, to put it in very fancy and sophisticated legal terms, the Palestinians have drawn the short end of the stick. Um, but then you look at what's happening is that Israel has launched this ceaseless campaign of vilification against not only the United Nations, you know, demanding the immediate resignation of the Secretary General, dressing up as a concentration camp in made in the Security Council by Israel's um, uh, clownish uh, representative to the UN and so on, but also an attack on public international law itself. Um, so when I look at your fundamental criticisms of the same institutions and um, regulations that Israel is attacking for supposedly being so detrimental to its interests, does that mean Israel has gone off the deep end? Yeah, to a certain extent, mm -hmm. uh, but I would not be surprised by that at all. And that's because Israel was born, if you like, off the deep end. <laughs> so, um, it's, but also it's not, from the womb of the United Nations. But that, but that's that is that is the, the great irony of it, isn't it? I mean, uh, one of the things that um, your question gives rise to in my in my memory, and I set this out in the in the in the postscript uh, at the book, and I shall never forget my. I don't know how to say my my great shock when I watched uh, the Israeli permanent representative of the United Nations in the Fourth Committee in debating what became resolution 77 slash 247, the resolution that refers that question on the illegality of the occupation to the ICJ, he said, and I will quote, when he was trying to convince member states that they shouldn't back the resolution in the fourth committee, he denounced that resolution um, as a poisonous measure, quote, a weapon of mass destruction in a jihad war of Israel demonization, he said that by involving the ICJ, any hopes for reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians are being driven off a cliff. Um, uh, he said these are libelous resolutions and endorsing incitement to terror and so on. And so it's come to the point where the question of Palestine is now seriously being presented. Issues around it are being presented um, by permanent representatives of, of countries, in this case, Israel in the halls, the hallowed halls of the UN, as, in, as involving terror. That is to say, not merely the question of Palestine, but having recourse to the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. As an act of terrorism. Amounts to terrorism, right? Mm -hmm. And if that's where, where the UN's mismanagement of the question of Palestine has brought us, what future the UN, in view of all of, of the hypocrisy that its actions or omissions mm -hmm 
have given rise to in this, if you like, mm -hmm. most important conflict. And we see this now in Gaza. So, mm -hmm. you know, when the war, the war, when the when the onslaught <clears throat> on Gaza commenced following uh, the actions of 7 October by the Palestinian paramilitaries in southern Israel. I, I thought to myself, well, we all knew that there would be an overwhelming response by virtue of the historical record, the Dahia doctrine, which the Israelis and their military uh, always operate under, which is to impose uh, uh, disproportionate, deliberate disproportionate force in the face of any Palestinian resistance and so on. We all knew it would only be a matter of a few days before there would be such a great amount of, uh, of violence uh, meted out, death and destruction in the Gaza Strip that one would expect the Secretary General of the United Nations, and indeed the Secretary Security Council to call for a ceasefire, right? But no. And to this day, it took 11 days for the, for the, for the Secretary General, 11 days to call for a humanitarian pause. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. And then maybe a humanitarian ceasefire shortly thereafter. And I just checked up before our talk today. Just yesterday, he, he issued a press release saying, again, uh, reaffirming his call for a humanitarian ceasefire. So if after I guess eight that's weeks, to avoid saying ceasefire, which would upset the Americans. Well, that's precisely it. So what does that give rise to, right? So you would expect the Security Council to be blocked by virtue of the veto powers of either one or the other great powers. And that's precisely what has happened. We were lucky to get a resolution out of the council with a US abstention and a Russian abstention and so on some weeks ago calling for a humanitarian pause. You would expect that of council by virtue of these powers, granted under international law, UN charter to each of these veto powers. But the security, but the secretary general of the United Nations, what has stopped this independent actor who is not meant at all, in fact, under international law, Article 100 of the UN Charter, bound not to receive nor uh, seek out instructions from member states. Why has he not called for a ceasefire, unconditional? We have now 20,000 Palestinians, either dead or, or, or under the rubble, uh, much more thousands, 30 or 40,000 injured. And the prognosis based on the occupying powers, a high command, is that they will continue with this bombardment, this forcible transfer of some 1.9 million people so far, that's about 80% of the population, into the south, open calls to depopulate the Gaza Strip, to starve them out. Starvation as a tool of warfare is absolutely prohibited. So whether they do it in one fell swoop over the course of the next few months, over a period of some time, say a year or two, when a ceasefire does take hold, but the Israelis now have boots on the ground over most of the Gaza Strip, the goal of the occupying power is abundantly clear. They've said it expressly. They wish, at the very least, to depopulate the territory. Why ever, in the face of all of this fact, would the United Nations, including its Secretary General, not call for a ceasefire? And and he but, seems to have imposed this um, limits of rhetorical observation, if you will, on all other senior um, officials of the organization. That, that's right. You know, I in his defense because I understand what it means to be a UN official, and I understand the difficulties of, of maintaining good relations, particularly with members of the P5. Um, access issues for humanitarian actors are always an, an issue for the UN. You want to maintain humanitarian access, and so sometimes principle just needs to be kept aside or whatever. There's always a calculation, so I understand that. Um, but, you know, in the end, in the end, I think on balance, one would expect a bit more principle in response. I thought, again, that perhaps it might be that the Secretary General and indeed the great powers at the uh, United Nations, in the United States in particular, is deferring to a so-called right of Israel to self-defense. But it wouldn't be that hard at all um, to just have a look at what the International Court of Justice said about Israel's purported right of self-defense. Doesn't exist. In 2004, precisely. See article, rather paragraph 139 of the ICJ's ruling in 2004, where it says very clearly that because Israel is an occupation of the OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territory, it can't invoke Article 51, that article of the UN Charter that does provide for a right of self-defense in the event of an armed attack against a member state. It can't argue Article 51 in relation to attacks that emanate from within the occupied territory. 
And so while Israel does have some rights under the laws of belligerent occupation to maintain law and order in the occupied territory, which does give it some rights to deploy force that is proportional, that is necessary, uh, and therefore limited to repel the attacks of October the 7th, which to be sure were heinous. Let's make no bones about that. They included war crimes and so on to the extent that they targeted civilian po uh, populations in Israel. It does not have a right of self-defense that is unlimited. Certainly nor not under right Article 51. Which is nor, right. That's right, nor a right of revenge. So the point is, in view of all of that, well, how, how, I ask seriously, what has stopped the United Nations, even in acting as an independent actor under the SG, the Secretary General, from calling for a ceasefire when its own principal judicial organist said self-defense doesn't apply here? But if given that that's how you view it, you know, and now you have also Israel on the one hand claiming it has an unassailable right to what it calls Judea and Samaria. Um, yet when the question is put to the ICJ, that's denounced as terrorism. Um, so they can't be that secure in their claim. But, you know, when you look at that and you, you look at the criticisms that you've just made of not only... Um, explicitly political actors in the UN system, but also of, of, of the dereliction of duty of the UN Secretariat itself, I get back to the question with which I introduced um, this discussion. Is the UN part of the problem or part of the solution? Um, and to what extent um, is it relevant to a resolution of the question of Palestine, particularly taking into consideration this is no longer the 1950s or 1980s, um, where the UN was viewed as a uh, significant global institution whose views cannot be ignored. Well, I must say, counterintuitive though it may it seem, although it may seem rather, um, I do believe that the United Nations matters uh, and is a very, very important role, if not the most important uh, player, forgive me, uh, in resolving the question of Palestine for the following reasons. And this also goes to my view of international law. Yes, I'm critical of international law, and indeed I'm critical of the United Nations, but I'm not critical of these things um, for criticism's own sake. Or to the Either, point of being dismissive. Well, indeed, indeed, I take no, I'm not a nihilist. I don't throw my hands up and say, well, this stuff is worthless. Let's not engage with it. Quite the opposite. International law does matter. And so too does the United Nations. The real question is, how do we make sure that the UN abides by its self-proclaimed identity, if you like, as the uh, standard bearer of the public international legal order? And so that is to hold it to account under the rules that it claims it it upholds in all of its action. So why ever would the United Nations be, in my view, indispensable uh, to a resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict? Well, that's simple. Um, left to their own devices, the Israelis will continue to take the whole as they largely have been able to do by virtue of the fact that the international community has basically set this file in the hands exclusively of the United States over the past 30 years at the very least. And so let, let to their own devices, the, the Palestinians and indeed the international community will see, will, will see no day of peace uh, in, in Palestine um, between the two. And so that's why you need a multilateral system uh, to give effect to, these, to this international law, which is um, nebulous in part uh, and needs to be given full effect. That's why recourse to the International Court of Justice is important notwithstanding that there's no guarantees it'll give the Palestinians or the General Assembly indeed what it means to push forward and so on. Um, you, at bottom, and I deal with this in the beginning of the book, the UN is unique. It's a revolution. It is the only body in the history of humankind that purports to have a universal vocation and representation of all of humanity. And for good or ill, even though the member states of the United Nations are not all of them democracies to be sure, they are representative to a certain extent of global society, civilization, et cetera. And so um, it's vital, it's of a vital import that the United Nations is 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 taken, is, is made use of by it's certainly the global subaltern class, the, the, the third world, um, to make the world a better place um, cut in the image of all humans, not merely those 
that have power or have a pedigree reaching back to you know Europe and imperialism and colonialism and so on. So there is a hopeful tone to the book, even though it is critical. Uh, and that I think is is the view that I have on on the value of the UN. I'm very, very uh, sure of that. On that hopeful and aspirational note, uh, Professor Ardim says, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and, and insights um, on connections. I would like to point out this was the 80th episode of Connections. We've devoted quite a few episodes to Palestine. Um, we've spoken for about an hour, and I think uh, this was the first episode on Palestine I've been able to get to the end of without once hearing the word Oslo, which is an extraordinary <laughs> relief and for which I really um, owe you a debt of uh, gratitude. Um, once again, um, the United Nations and the question of Palestine, um, the very recently published uh, book by Professor uh, RDM says it's an important and it's a powerful work of scholarship. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Maureen. I wish you all the best.